Well, welcome. Uh, this is John MacArthur. I'm here at, uh, at Wikibon headquarters. Uh, I am John MacArthur, and I am the moderator for today's Peer Insight. Um, we are here today uh, with Brigham Hyde, who's an adjunct professor at Tufts University, and he's now managing director of Relay, Relay Technology Management. Um, uh, Brigham has worked in drug development and investment banking and, um, has, and has now moved to a managing director at Relay. We're also joined by Sid uh, uh, Probstein, CTO of Ativio, uh, and Jeff Kelly, who is Wikibon's big data analyst. And we're here today to talk about combining unstructured and structured, structured data for delivering big data business value. So Brigham, let me kick it off with you and just ask you, you came from, you have, you have an interesting background having, you, you have your doctorate in pharmacology. pharmacology. You've worked, you're working as an adjunct professor. You've done investment banking and now you're at Relay. Tell us about that journey and a little bit about what you're doing. The idea of Relay actually in, in 2008, myself and uh, the other co-founder, David Greenwald, who's a PhD in genetics and looking at um, drug development and the challenges in terms of data overload and analysis that they faced. Um, we were both frustrated uh, scientific entrepreneurs trying to get ideas out of the lab, trying to understand a bit more about how the marketplace uh, worked for those decisions, and I think realized very quickly that uh, the people making those decisions, high-risk decisions, were very um, underserved in terms of uh, access to data and meaningful insight from that data. Um, and we set out to create Relay kind of on that principle. And uh, my experience in banking, uh, in the meantime, confirmed a lot of that from the other side. So, you know, having to analyze those companies and those uh, drug development assets, for instance, and realizing that it was a highly qualitative process in some ways, uh, with a lot of information to pour over, which was largely being done on a manual basis. I mean, I lived in the spreadsheet world, you know, and, and manually curated data for a long time. So um, really wanted to get at those issues and, and stepped into big data to do it. What are some of the kinds of data that, that, that the scientists didn't have access to, that they need access to, in order to make more informed decisions? Well, just to give you an example, let's say I'm looking at a, uh, a phase two drug development asset. And you think about the attributes of that asset that are important. There's certainly commercial aspects such as, you know, uh, transactional information about it or uh, how much I paid for it or how much the market size is. That's all uh, out there. I think the interesting thing is to then connect that to the scientific and clinical information. So while it's great to say I have an asset for colorectal cancer, it's another thing to understand the underlying science of that asset and the information that's out there that could be mined to determine is it more or less likely to work? Um, is the clinical data there to support uh, affording of, of, of the asset and what other regulatory agencies respond to it? And the connection of that data, I think, is really one of the crucial things Relay has done. Uh, enabled under the covers by the ability to unify many different types of data. Um, so structured or unstructured, we'll talk about that. But just simply finding a way to get this thing into one place and then ask it directed questions that made sense to users. Do you know what questions you want to ask? Or do the investors know what questions they want to ask? You know, it's interesting. I, I think um, we have a lot of engineering talent at Relay, and our CTO is former CTO of Elsevier, Mark Krallenstein, uh, a guy who founded Northern Light, you know, 15 years ago, and one of the early search companies. So we have a lot of engineering talent. I think what makes Relay unique is that we have uh, folks like myself, people with uh, experience in biology, pharmacology, and also in business, that understand what the question we're trying to ask of the data is. Um, and I think that's why we've taken on the approach of developing a SaaS product because we actually know some of the questions and can put together uh, those linked concepts. Um, and I think that's maybe where we differ from some pure technology plays and why we're a bit unique. Um, the users themselves that we interact with are business development folks. So this is maybe an MD, MBA or a PhD at a high business level. They might know the information they want, but they don't really know where to get it from. 
and are largely living in the world of being served by databases where you download a CSV and then have to churn information. They may go to 20 independent data sources internally and externally to get information. So there's no kind of unified process and no way to kind of connect the dots between those efforts. And it's, it's I mean, our product competes with manual data curation. There's no question, uh, which is boggles my mind sometimes, but you know, that's, that's the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, Brigham, so we're talking about, it sounds like more than just structured data, of course, this is, this is a lot of unstructured content, it's documents, and talk a little bit about the types of data assets you're talk, we're trying to connect here. Because um, it's one thing to kind of bring together disparate data sets if they're structured data. Right. Uh, it's a much different thing if it's unstructured content or multi-structured content. So talk about that. Yeah, and I, it's maybe worth talking about how we started technologically. I mean, we, we started in a SQL database at one point. That was the basis of, of Relay in the early days. And I think we immediately realized that we were leaving out and, and unable to really handle lots of big data sets, for instance, the scientific literature. You know, handling that and, and from a text mining and natural language perspective in a relational database just doesn't really work. Totally unscalable. Not to mention, if I try and connect that to something like uh, SEC documents, mm -hmm. you know, there's no natural connection there. So uh, we looked at it as, okay, what's important here? Importance is ontologies and ontologic search first, and then, you know, exploratory and creative search, free text search and things like that. And so we wanted to find ways to actually connect the dots between those. We do it with our ontologies, but also uh, by partnering with Ativio and the covers, which enables us to actually make those connections really seamlessly and scalably. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we thought about moving off of a relational database, what we wanted to do was build for the problem we had today, but also say, we know there's going to be, you know, data's going up and to the right. You know, transparency's going up and to the right. We're going to need to be able to connect these dots long term and, and put the pieces together. Mm -hmm. For, for those who aren't um, uh, scientists and, 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 and drug discovery folks, so yeah. you, you know, describe what you mean by ontology. Yeah, so in, in particular in this world of life science, ontologies are massively important. And I'll give you an example. Um, you know, if I'm uh, talking about a disease and I'm talking about uh, lung cancer, sounds like one thing. It's not one thing. There's small cell lung cancer. There's non-small cell. There's different stages. You would also call certain types of lung cancer solid tumors because it's a tumor type. So understanding ontologically that those things are connected and you know, being able to then relate them across relational databases and document sets into one you know, common entity is really the crucial piece. So we spend a lot of our time, we have right now uh, internally um, nine custom ontologies that we use that range from things like diseases to genes to drugs to uh, research topics, to people, um, you know, throughout journals and into business terms. Because I think the other big thing for our users is being able to leverage scientific information to make business decisions. So understanding the risk associated with uh, a given disease pathway and factoring that into their commercial decision about, hey, there's these M&A opportunities in front of me. So we try and connect those dots using ontologies. Well, well, maybe we could dig into the technology a little bit. So uh, take us through your journey kind of from that from the relational database days to where you are today and kind of some of the underlying technologies that are using, you're using to actually uh, sure. kind of connect all these uh, unstructured uh, pieces of content. Yeah, so in the, in the relational database world, or our ye old database as we call it, <laughs> um, you know, we had, we, we were constantly fighting the ontology problem. Also, anytime we tried to add a new database, we were adding complexity and there would always be kind of gain and loss every time we did something. And I think we wanted to solve the immediate problem first, which was let's flatten it out, let's get everything in there and connect it, have the connecting uh, or the common connection be the ontologies kind of sitting on top. So that led us towards more of an index-based system, but we didn't want to lose the capability of being able to ask relational questions and structure data when it was appropriate, either for uh, purpose or for speed. So we wanted to kind of play in both worlds, and uh, we are lucky enough to get connected with uh, Sid and the guys over to Tibia. I remember our first uh, meeting, you know, Sid kind of drawing on a whiteboard and me going, you can do that? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was an eye-opener for me. And we examined a couple of technology companies um, but ultimately, you know, it was clear that they could solve our immediate problem with the databases we had and without us losing anything. There were no real trade-offs at the get-go. And then long-term, you know, creating a scalable data operation was very obvious. And scalable in two ways, both in terms of the size of data. You know, we 
constantly push on you know the size of the database that we can and constantly advancing that and we expect more data in the future I mean, you talk about uh, long road talk about medical records or talk about any mm -hmm. of this stuff which we're not in that world yet but mm -hmm. we may be someday mm -hmm. you know you have to have uh, scale of size and performance but also scale in terms of data types so the ability in the future to connect to um, you know, Oracle databases, Hadoop, you know, whatever it might be long term, you know, those things were needed to be part of the roadmap. So we definitely considered that when, when evaluating and ultimately chose Tibio for a lot of those exact reasons. Uh, so, Sid, so, uh, tell us, so, uh, Sid uh, Probstein, again, the uh, CTO of Tibio, mm -hmm. um, tell us about that first meeting and sort of what you brought to the table when, when, when you met with Brigham. Well, I'll tell you, it was. Uh, it was a great experience because so they were part of a, a big uh, mass high tech uh, kind of startup um, boot camp lot slash of, lot survivor of money, island. A lot right? of money flown into uh, into in, into pharmaceuticals that's right. here in, in Massachusetts. Oh, well, Mass so, Challenge, I got to give mass, them a mass plug. Challenge. We were yeah, uh, a first right. year finalist. So oh, okay. That was one of our ones and we got connected. The reason I'm sure the reason that they were a finalist is because. You look at what they did, it's so incredibly exciting. It's the convergence of the things that I believe are going to drive our economy. And I say that kind of, it's kind of a big statement. I actually really believe it will drive the economy to no small degree for you know, years, decades, it's hard to say. But look at what they put together, right? Investment background, so they understand the process of funding these things. They have the, obviously, PhDs in the, in, in the actual science, right? So they understand the, the technology, the capabilities, all the different aspects of it. But they also thought about what, what does, this, does the decision maker who's trying to get from point A to point D, right, it's a longer journey in pharma, how are they going to get there? Well, in the old days, they would have, you know, said we want to look at this drug or this drug, could you evaluate this element from a phase two versus another one from a phase two? And scientists would get together and they would do a couple things. One, they would have a spreadsheet, right? And they would also have typically a taxonomy on disk, probably a bunch of folders that they hand built, right, with different interesting description names, like this one describes the mechanism, this one describes the interactions, this one's, and then they would pile PDFs into those documents, and then they would, as a scientist, an eminent, you know, MD, make a decision, right? Yep. And that's what they would drive the decision. Now the problem is, that model worked great, but now we're awash in data. There's far too much data for us to easily consume in that model. More PDFs than we could possibly, you know, organize into our hand taxonomy. Plus you have these huge data sets, right? All of this massive amount of, you know, observation data, sensor data that's being recorded. <coughs> Putting them together, any one silo is interesting. It's putting them together, yeah. that's where you get the spark that leads to that kind of amazing return. And essentially, you know, when I walked in, the first time I met with these guys, they had all of the pieces except the information access layer. They had a database with these different parts of data hand curated, put together. And the problem was it wasn't a great demo, right? It was, you have to start by pull, doing a big pull down list and navigating down, again, typical database stuff. Yep. And they said, look, we need something that's much more the way the world information works on the web, right? We want kind of a search box, but it's not just search, right? Because we also have to show this aggregate information. The whole point is to take some concept like, you know, whatever that element of that phase two clinical trial is and say, I want to understand the value of this in context with all other things across all the other silos. So, okay, That's, so said, we're, we're, we did it for them. That, that was the key thing. We were able yeah, to take yeah. that, preserve the structured data, the relationships between it, do full text search, but then also, support SQL so they can use Tibco Spotfire, right, right, to do incredible visualizations. Yes. And that brought, it, brought the data to life. So we're here to talk about uh, delivering business value. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so give me the business value angle on this. What, what we're, we're making better decisions, we're making, what's the return to the investor, what's the in return to the drug company? Yeah, so a couple of unique things that um, Relay can do, and I'll, I'll give you kind of three brief cases because I think it's, it's useful to describe. You know, a common uh, job of somebody who's in BD, who's our main client right now, you know, is they get tasked, okay, uh, we need to be in Alzheimer's disease. Okay, you need to go find what's coming up in Alzheimer's disease and, uh, and make an acquisition and make a business case for that acquisition, but also understand where we are with the scientific case. And they'll go out, and, and their database is out there that they can download spreadsheets of these are the companies with these assets, but they're not getting the information on, for instance, a mechanism. So, for you know, right now you might say uh, you know a hot uh, target is you know PI3 kinase, or in, in Alzheimer's uh, might be Parkin or something like that. These are genes, by the way, that I'm mentioning. Um, 
we can detect the historical trends and the underlying data that it could have told you last year this is going to be the hot thing next year. And we actually take the step on the analytics and algorithm side to actually factor that into evaluation of an asset. So we have this thing called RVI, which is Relative Value Index, which is our attempt at making a stock market for a drug development assets. So if I'm comparing two phase two drugs, I can factor in the underlying information and the trends behind it and understand that this one's maybe a bit better than that one or this one's increasing faster. You can ask different questions of it, but it's engaging you know, kind of the raw data to give you a quantitative piece back to measure on. And on a sophisticated level, we actually factor it into valuation. So we can actually write a model that can say, based on this RVI, it's worth X more dollars or X less dollars, which is a real tangible uh, thing for people. I think the other part of it is that, you know, you're engaging somebody with live information. So as something changes, you know, you can actually get that change. Um, and and see and be alerted when like you know some some big paper was published or somebody uh, presented at a conference which totally changes the game you know for your world and now you can understand it and it's that being current that I think is really valuable to folks right now this is a very episodic thing think of the Alzheimer's case I'm probably going to put my uh, three younger analysts on this for two months they're going to spend a bunch of time churning data we might get to an answer and the day that you get that answer it's stale. And it's, you know, you lose the value you just created, you'll have to do it again. And I think uh, that's a big component. One other big piece we focus on, just to give you a use case, is around uh, KOLs. And one of the things that struck me... KOLs. Uh, sorry, uh, knowledge leaders. So in science, you know, there'll be a top researcher who's a major influencer in a field. And if you're in biopharma, there's a couple worlds here. You may uh, want to partner with them because they're inventing the next therapy for whatever disease. You may uh, want to fund some of their research because, you know, you just want to be with the smart guys. They also may be an influencer both at the FDA or in clinical adoption. So identifying who those guys are is really, really important. And we can actually track individuals and measure things about them that uh, infer value and can ask specific data, quantitative data questions of them um, and, and identify kind of who should be there. Yeah. So, so talk about, uh, you know, really, let's boil this down to real the business value in terms of is it making better decisions? Is it making more decisions, uh, faster decisions? Um, more accurate decisions. What what really are the main main benefits here? Um, the main benefit is you know on the asset side, you can make a better decision. I mean, you're getting they don't have access to the the trend information at all in a quantitative way. Mm -hmm. So they may you know understand intuitively that it's there, but nobody's ever said, yep, that's the number that correlates to the right. thing you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. So. By having that information at your fingertips, you can make that decision earlier. It provides an evidence base that enables you to leap over the wall of, yes, let's do this, as opposed to waiting for consensus to get there and then being too late. In pharma, by the way, venture tends to be on the cutting edge. It now enables the pharmas to be venture-like in that they don't, you know, they're at the cutting edge of what's going on, which I think is really attractive to them because then they can pay a little less for an asset earlier than they would have waited and paid, you know, God knows what for later. Uh, so there's definitely value there. I think the other is in terms of the time that they spend or what they spend doing with their time. So if the analysis is already done and updating at their desktop, they spend more time worrying about the kind of the narrowed group of information, a narrowed group of uh, assets, targets, mechanisms that are of interest. Instead of, you know, spending their time dragging data down and manually curating, you have the smart guys with the experience really focused on making a good decision as opposed to, you know, just getting the, to the answer. And so we're trying to make that leap. For the people that just, uh, for the people that just joined us online or on the call, uh, just a reminder, we're here with Brigham Hyde, who's adjunct professor at uh, Tufts University and a managing director at Relay Technology Management and with, and with Sid Probo Probstein, CTO of Ativio, um, and Jeff Kelly, Wikibon's big data analyst. We're talking about how to combine structured and unstructured data to deliver business value. Um, and we've been talking a lot in the pharma uh, space. I want to open up the, um, uh, the, to the audience to see if there are any questions that, that they have. We've got uh, quite a large number of people online here. So if someone has a question, let me pause for a second. Uh, good morning. This is David Sawyer. Um, I have got a, a, a question uh, that I'd uh, like uh, your opinion on. Well, what are the, what are the, how do you see the provision of data going forward? Well, what are the sources of that data 
uh, is it um, government data? Is it uh, uh, data collected by uh, data providers, uh, Google? What, what, what are the sources of data? How do you Sid, why don't you, why don't you yeah. talk about that? Because you're in more areas than pharma, obviously. I think the, as I was uh, alluding to earlier, the business value is not so much by creating intelligence inside one silo, by, but by creating intelligence across silos, right? And that's what really, really does. They let you look at so many sources. So I believe that companies will find more and more innovative ways to create value or opportunities for themselves <coughs> by bringing together more and more data. And it's going to be everything. It's going to be public sources. You're going to be see licensing sources. I think there are already multiple efforts to create uh, kind of exchanges uh, around data, right? And, and create markets yep. for data. So that's, that's all going to feed into it. And I think essentially what the, the lesson and I think the pattern that you can follow from, from what Relay is doing is the insight is about across the data and putting, how powerful is it? Again, I look back, what was it that discussion like five years ago inside Big Pharma, right? It's a bunch of doctors, each with their own viewpoints and experiences, taking as much data as they can consume and trying to make a data, uh, some kind of decision. And of course, that brings you quickly to opinions and round tables and delay, exactly as Brigham said, right? So if you can put a number around that stuff, but actually have that number be meaningful and trusted and be able to show, hey, it maps to all these different data sources, some which are internal, yes, we could agree those are biased, but there are external sources that validate it, right? By creating that linkage. So the, the answer is data from everywhere. It's going to be, we're, we're awash in data today, we're talking about big data, wait a couple of years. Right? Think of the number of sensors that are putting out observations right now. When that stuff starts to get spooled up and stored, we're, we're never going to see the end of it. And scalability, is, it's not a um, nice to have, it's a, a right to play. If you can't handle these volumes and, and make these connections, I think the, the future leaves you by. Mm -hmm. Let me follow on can, Sid's can, comments. Can I just follow, uh, follow that up a little bit? The, the, you're implying this huge amount of data, and I agree with you entirely. That'll be impossible to bring all of that together in one place. Uh, how would you, how would you, just, just from the point of view of physics, of, of, of sending that data, how would you see that being dealt with uh, in the future? Um, are you going to uh, extract from different locations? Do we need to analyze in place and then pull? Probably. So the scale of things will, in time, put real pressure on all the different parts of the computing, you know, the infrastructure that, that uh, is needed to do this. But that's why cloud, right? This the entire cloud model, cloud computing has emerged. And the idea that hey, um, I can rent time, I can spin up a large number of servers. Maybe I really need a huge number, but I only need it for a few days to crunch through some massive data set to get insight, and then I can have it shrink back down to a more normal data set. Uh, I think that, you know, the distribution of the problem is definitely the future. Now, today, for example, Ativio, our active intelligence engine, is essentially it's a sharded or distributed repository or an engine. Uh, you can put any kind of information in, and you can distribute it across lots and lots of servers. Uh, you guys are using Amazon servers for a while. Mm -hmm. you know, many different cloud configurations are possible. Mm -hmm. And you can spin up a couple of new ones as you need them to bring in more data. So I don't, I'm, it's not unique to Ativio. What I'm telling you is I, the answer to that question is really the distribution of the problem, right? Is, and the interconnection of everything and the ability to access and federate, those things are happening now. And as more and more providers get into that world, you know, it'll, it'll become easier to do. Yeah, let me answer this question from and both sides of it from a limited perspective. I'm a data buyer and an, a, and an analysis creator, right? Or a metadata creator. You know, that's essentially what Relay does. And I spend about a third of my time just shopping data sets. So on your first question, which I think is a really important one, which is where is the data? Mm -hmm. um, you know, government is some of it. I think, you know, ultimately, there's going to be this kind of secondary market of trading analysis. So um, look at what's happening with, uh, with Thomson Reuters right now, with LexisNexis. I mean, they're selling raw data. Sure, you can download a stream of their data, but they're beginning to sell metadata and analysis of that, so tagging. And so I could see a world in which you know, people take their own internal data sets and maybe I buy a specific analysis of it. So I want to know temporally, give me the tags for each company and when they announce a certain type of thing. And I might buy that instead of downloading the entire LexisNexis data set and asking it a question. And I, by the way, as a data seller, look at potentially that being a model for us. I know that people in my marketplace and SaaS are beginning to be asked for APIs to their analysis of a data set. Mm -hmm. So you might have somebody who's, like us, is trying to answer a specific question, taking certain data sets, unifying them, scaling them, making them live and updating, and then 
selling my answer to a certain question off of that data set. So I think there's going to be a couple different roles to play and add to that the companies which have their own internal data that they all need to deal with. So I, I think it'll be a merge of that. Sid, I'm interested in your perspective on this question of how fast does someone have to react to new information and particularly in the world of unstructured data. We had, we had uh, someone on recently um, on the Cube um, who were discussing uh, if, you, if, it, if I analyze the data in a half an hour after the data was created, I've, I've lost a quarter of a million dollars. Um, mm -hmm. It was in the casino world, right? So, yep. you know, uh, how, how do you see that impacting, you know, the customer set that you're serving? Well, to be honest, a lot of the um, advantages people are creating for themselves in the market are now done through speed, right? I can take some analysis that I do, I did it every week, I did it every month, it was fine, the volume of shopping has gone up, right? I have more of an e-channel e now to let people in, so I have more data coming in, and now I find if I can process the data faster, I can create a, a window during which I monetize whatever insight it is that I'm getting a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And that's very, I mean, that's just a real, again, a very real world um, phenomenon. You know, obviously in financial markets, uh, one of my banking clients said something like, you know, if we can get 1% more insight, that's enough to trade on, right, for one second, because I can make a trade in 100 milliseconds or something like that. Right. So speed is, it, but it's all part of a continuum. There are many questions that can be answered slowly. And often those answers are the ones that you then could cook up with other answers, other parts of the puzzle, but that you need to do more, more frequently. And the entire equation changes and becomes interesting when one of those changes dramatically, right? Suddenly it skews everything off. And uh, that's actually the point of the sort of timeliness and the incremental update. I think it's much more powerful in unstructured because we're not used to it, right? Think of those MDs sitting around the table. They make the decision, they make the right decision, and the company marches on, but they miss you know, two small updates that would have changed everything because they were unstructured, you know, they were press releases or law buried in a journal somewhere, they didn't pick up on it. So systems like Relay Tech Management, that's going to solve that for them and say, hey, come back, revisit this decision. Most companies are not so good at doing that, so, but I think that's going to be an emerging skill, right? Remembering why we made that decision, what data it was based on, and then understanding now what do we need to adjust and mm -hmm. being able to track every, every decision and say, are we still on point for this? Right. Versus the old model, which is, well, we put X million dollars and Y people into it and discovered it was the wrong approach and so, you know, but we did three of those, so we, we arbitraged it effectively, right? Now you maybe you could start two ventures based on that, you know, much more detailed and much more thorough analysis. Let me anecdotally. John. Go ahead. Hello, John. This is yes. John Furrier. Hey, John. How you doing? Hey, I have a question for Sid and the folks on the panel there. Um, you know, obviously we love Hadoop. There's a lot of uh, conversations around a uh, blog post on GigaOM about Hadoop's days are numbered. And uh, have you guys been following uh, Google, Google's demo product and percolator? And the, and the thesis was is that Hadoop is too hard to use and might not stay around much longer. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have an opinion on that? And, and uh, how do you see the whole Hadoop ecosystem evolving given Google's recent public uh, disclosure of Dremel and Percolator. Well, I'm not sure I would count on Google as an authority over data analysis, to, to be honest. they What they do is pretty unusual uh, in the sense that they focus really heavily on web pages and the public web, and it's a very interesting application. Um, I think Hadoop has a role to play. It is pretty much synonymous with big data, but it's a little bit of an error. People think of big data as being all about volume. It's not. There's more to it. Um, you know, you could look at it as volume and variety and uh, velocity, which we were talking about earlier, right? So you have many different aspects. Uh, Hadoop is great at dealing with the volume aspect where I have, let's say, I track every click to my website and this produces billions of observations every day. These observations individually are worthless. Uh, not really. They're, they're not worthless, but you wouldn't be interested. You wouldn't have a company meeting over the fact that, you know, Sid Probstein requested a, a size, you know, image of size 50, my logo image from the web server. It's not relevant. What you want to know is, okay, which parts of my site did Sid visit? And maybe Sid isn't interesting, but I want to know across all the people, or maybe an audience, one segment of my audience, right, which site sites they went to. So you take that low item value data and you feed that through a system like Hadoop, and there are many others too, but Hadoop is the one that seems to be very popular, and you produce high value summary records, right? This is an analysis, those billions of records now became a handful of records which tells me which of my website sections or properties were most popular and I could even segment it further by audience. That's very valuable insight, but the truth of the matter is we've been doing that kind of analytics for a long time, decades. 
for one thing, we haven't had the huge volumes that e-commerce systems can now produce, right? So we haven't had to deal with that much data. But even more than that, you know, the insight was kind of there. We were able to basically take it far enough. Um, but it's still within one silo. Hadoop solves the problem of massive volume in a silo we already understand. But Hadoop alone, once it produces that data, it's still a silo. And the, again, the beauty of something like a relay tech management is you take that output, it's one piece